Hi, I'm Charlie Garrett. I'm a minister from Sarasota, Florida, and I'm traveling to all of the 50 states in order to preach about Jesus Christ, about our national heritage, our founding fathers, what they believed, and uh, to read uh, the constitutions of the states that I uh, am in where it mentions God, and uh, basically to try to get some spiritual revival in this nation and people turning their hearts back to God, specifically through the one mediator between God and man, which is Jesus Christ. And um, before I get started, I'd like to go ahead and read a prayer which I composed before coming here for the state and people of Utah. Gird your sword upon your side, O mighty one. Clothe yourself with splendor and majesty. In your majesty, ride forth victoriously in behalf of truth, humility, and righteousness. Let your right hand display awesome deeds. Let your sharp arrows pierce the hearts of the king's enemies. Let the nations fall beneath your feet. Today I stand at the capital of Utah, my 38th state to visit and the 45th accepted into our union. Grand and supreme ruler of the universe, it is with great pleasure that I'm here in Utah and I thank you for the opportunity to share a portion of your word with the state today. Before my message, I'd like to remind the people of this state the words of Paul, which are part of your eternal and unchanging word. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. Lord, a majority of the state has unwisely disregarded this word and accepted another gospel, one which is no gospel at all. It is my deepest and most sincere prayer that you send your Holy Spirit to open the eyes of these people to their fallen state. Truly, there is one gospel and one Lord, Jesus Christ. It is through him alone that we are justified. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Since we have now ju been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Lord, these people are the work of your hands. Call them from every walk and from every misguided faith to, to a saving knowledge of you and your Son. Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. This is my petition, and this is my prayer for the state of Utah, the beehive state, whose motto is industry. May their industry be established in bringing honor and glory to the person and work of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Next, I'd like to read the 125th Psalm, a song of ascents. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people both now and forevermore. The scepter of the wicked will not remain over the land allotted to the righteous. For then the righteous might use their hands to do evil. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good, to those who are upright in heart. But those who turn to crooked ways, the Lord will banish with the evildoers. Peace be upon Israel. And next I'd like to read the preamble to the Constitution of the State of Utah. Grateful to Almighty God for life, liber life and liberty, we, the people of Utah, in order to secure and perpetuate the principles of free government, do ordain and establish this Constitution. And then they have a couple of uh, subsections on religious liberty. All men have the inherent and inalienable right to enjoy and defend their lives and liberties, to acquire, possess, and protect property, to worship according to the dictates of their consciences, to assemble peaceably, protest against wrongs, and petition for redress of grievances, to communicate freely their thoughts and opinions, being responsible for the abuse of that right. And on it says, the rights of conscience shall never be infringed, nor shall any person be incompetent as a witness or a juror on account of religious belief or the absence thereof. There shall be no union in ch uh, of church and state, nor shall any church dominate the state or interfere with its functions. No public money or property shall be appropriated for or applied to any religious worship, exercise, or instruction, or for the support of any ecclesiastical establishment. And next I'd like to read a uh, proclamation signed by President George Washington in 1795, a Thanksgiving Day proclamation. When we re review the calamities which afflict so many other nations, the present condition of the United States affords much matter of consolation and satisfaction. Our exemption hitherto 
from foreign war and increasing prospect of the continuance of that exception, the great degree of internal tranquility we have enjoyed, the recent confirmation of that tranquility by the suppression of an insurrection which so wantonly threatened it, the happy course of our public affairs in general, the unexampled unex prosperity of all classes of our citizens, our, our circumstances which peculiarly mark our situation with the indications of the divine beneficence towards us. In such a state of things, it is in an especial manner our duty as a people with devout reverence and affectionate gratitude to acknowledge our many and great obligations to Almighty God and to implore Him to continue and confirm the blessings we experience. Deeply penetrated with this sentiment, I, George Washington, President of the United States, do recommend to all religious societies and denominations and to all persons whomsoever within the United States to set apart and observe Thursday, the 19th day of February, next as a day of public thanksgiving and prayer, and on that day to meet together and render their sincere and hearty thanks to the great ruler of the nations for the manifold and signal mercies which distinguish our lot as a nation, particularly for the possession of constitutions of government which unite and by their union establish liberty with order for the preservation of our peace, foreign and domestic, for the liberty with order, for the preservation of our peace, foreign and domestic, for the seasonable control which has been given to a spirit of disorder in the suppression of the late insurrection, and generally for the prosperous course of our affairs, public and private, and at the same time humbly and fervently to beseech the kind author of these blessings graciously to prolong them to us, to imprint on our hearts a deep and solemn sense of our obligations to him for them, to teach us rightly to estimate their immense sense of uh, value, to preserve us from the arrogance of prosperity and from hazarding the advantages we enjoy by delusive pursuits, to dispose us to merit the countenance of his favors, not by abusing them, by our gratitude for them and by a corresponding conduct as citizens and men, to render this country more and more a safe and propitious asylum for the unfortunate of other countries, to extend among us true and useful knowledge, to dis diffuse and establish habits of sobriety, order, morality, and piety, and finally, to import part all the blessings we possess or ask for ourselves to the whole family of mankind in testimony whereof I have caused the seal of the United States of America to be affixed to these presents and signed with my hand. And that was George Washington, first president of the United States of America. Next, I'd like to read the preference, preface to the Gideon's Bible. The Bible contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its histories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is a traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's charter. Here paradise is restored, heaven opened, and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand subject, our good the design, and the glory of God its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. It is a mine of wealth, a paradise of glory, a river of pleasure. It is given you in life, will be opened at the judgment, and be remembered forever. It involves the highest responsibility, will reward the greatest labor, and will condemn all who trifle with its sacred contents. Now, for the past uh, nine states, I've been speaking on the book of Romans. Today, I'm going to divert from that. Uh, you may have heard in the prayer that I made for the state of Utah that I read Galatians 1.6. I'm going to read that again, and then I'm going to speak on Galatians 1.6. And I had no, um, I, I've done no preparation for this. My wife and I decided to drive up here today rather than tomorrow to do this. And so I didn't prepare at all. It's all off the top of my head. And so I hope that uh, I'm not too disorganized. But anyway, Galatians 1.6. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. And going on in 7, it says, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you with and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed.